welcome everyone to Eastern Connecticut's third annual One Book, One Region. Uh, my name is Betty Ann Ryder, and I um, work in adult services here at the Groton Public Library, but I'm also very active in the One Book Committee. Um, before I even start with what I've been asked to do, I hope you'll look around the room and just um, help me thank the two men who made this possible. Um, Dan Dyer and Jim Stuhl are both here today, and it just looks great. Isn't it? I've just been asked to introduce the committee and tell you a little bit about how we go about choosing the one book. Um, so let me um, ask you a question. Have you um, all been on a committee where everyone looks around and waits for somebody else to volunteer to do the work? Yeah. Um, but this isn't a committee like this. This is a wonderful committee. Everybody contributes. Everybody volunteers to do something that they can do. And even more important to a librarian, everyone reads. And that's what we need on this committee. We need readers because um, we ask people to bring their suggestions with them. And if any of you would like to join the committee, we're always happy to accept more members. We're always looking for new people and new ideas. Let me tell you who is on the committee, though. We have Chris Bradley from Connecticut Library Consortium, Jim Landhair from Norwich Free Academy. We have uh, Tara Samuel is in the back from the Otis Library. I think I just saw Judy Liskoff walk in from the uh, Waterford Library. Susan Larson from Literacy Volunteers is here. Uh, Deneen Roth from Fitch High School. They are a new um, participant this year, so we're happy to have them. Uh, Stuart Lampson was here earlier. He had to leave from Bank Square Books, but he is a um, member of the committee. And um, I'm not sure if I saw Camille Moore come in, but we do have um, a member from Eastern Connecticut State University who's been very active this year in the committee. So um, please let one of us know if you'd be willing to join us next year on choosing the book. So this year, we began meeting in December. And what happens is we ask everyone to bring some uh, books with them to that first meeting, some ideas. And of course, we have certain parameters that we start with. Um, it has to be in paperback. Um, it has to be a book that is not so long that it will scare high school students away. Um, there are various variables that we look at even before, you know, before anything happens. Um, but everybody comes and brings a few ideas with them. And Jim always brings a bag full. <laughs> and, uh, and then we pass the books around and we start talking about them. And by the end of that meeting, we usually have come down to a few books that we tell everybody to go home and look at and decide whether they're, you know, what we're interested in. Um, then we have a second meeting, and we usually just throw away the ones that we had at the first meeting and, and say, nope, none of those are going to work. And usually, though, around the second meeting, we um, come to a pretty good idea of what we want to do. We're, we're usually very um, much in agreement that, you know, by that time. This year, that did not happen. Um, probably around the fifth meeting, we were still bringing books and saying, what do you think of this one? How about that one? And, and we were just not having a whole lot of luck. And then came the Kite Runner. And we um, asked everyone to take it home and read it like we always do. And when we came back at the next meeting, we knew that we had a winner. And everyone was just um, totally unanimous that this was the book for this year. Um, we just think it has great possibilities, it's timely, and a great story. Um, we're just so enthusiastic about The Kite Runner and its author, Khaled Hosseini. Um, Jim Landhair is now going to tell you a little bit about what we've planned for this year. We have some great activities coming. You have to remember what the goals of One Book, One Region is. And if you have one of those bookmarks, or one of the thousands of bookmarks that have been printed up for it, you can actually take a look at it. The goal is really for people to come together and discuss ideas. We're looking for people to broaden their appreciation of reading, break down those barriers, and just enjoy a good book. So one of the best things that can happen is people get around and they read the same book and they get to talk about it. And that's a really important thing. It doesn't happen enough. Well, not just reading the book. That's not enough. At least for this committee, it's not enough. So we've decided that there's some other events to bring people together. Because I know what would happen. People would go ahead and see that the choice was the kite runner. They'd read the book, and they'd say, OK. And they would never come together to discuss those ideas. So there are three book discussions that are already pre um, presently scheduled. I'm sure there'll be a few more. 
there's uh, film festivals that are going to be taking place here at the Groton Library, here at the Water at Waterford Library, at Otis Library. There are going to be films. So a lot of the libraries are sponsoring films about Afghanistan. Now, I'm sure that if we grab the globe and ask some of you to point Afghanistan out on the globe, some of you would struggle, okay? So you would be no different than the high school students that they talk about all the time, all right? So all of us would struggle sometimes to find some of these places on the globe. Well, the film series, along with a couple of really, really good lectures. One is from uh, UConn professor Betty Hansen talking about Afghanistan in world politics. And um, Joseph Vorbeck from UC, uh, the Coast Guard Academy is going to talk about evolution of modern Afghanistan also. So there's going to be some of the talks. Now I can tell you that the events that you see on the bookmark are not all. There's a website that has been created, and interestingly, it's called One Book, One Region. It's .org, and the whole thing, you have to spell it out, One Book, One Region, and all of the events, as they get scheduled, will be placed on the website. So you'll see lots of different events coming up from time to time. Uh, there are going to be kite-making workshops. There are going to be uh, mosaic workshops, things like that. So lots of activities for everybody to come together, and that's the goal, so that you come together and talk about the book, talk about some of the different ideas in the book. So at this point, I'm going to introduce you to the president of the Connecticut Library Association. Now probably our greatest resource in these communities is our libraries. It's one of the greatest resources that we can always have as a community. So let me introduce you to Chris Bradley. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, committee, for allowing me to be the one who introduces all of you to Dr. Haled Hosseini, the author of The Kite Runner. It's not easy to describe this book for those of you who have not yet read it. I could say that it is the story of a boy's coming of age in Afghanistan, but that would be a little like saying that the Iliad is a buddy novel set in Turkey. <laughs> Instead, I will share with you Dr. Hosseini's own description of his work from an article that he wrote in The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, last year. He writes, I created a troubled 12-year-old boy named Amir, the privileged son of a wealthy Pashtun merchant living in Kabul in 1975, and his angelic friend Hassan, a minority Hazara and the son of Amir's crippled servant. I developed a deep and unusual friendship between the boys only to make Amir betray Hassan in an unspeakable way. I shattered the boys' lives. I watched the brutalized Hassan pay the price for his guileless devotion to Amir, and watched Amir grow into a brooding, haunted, guilt-ridden man in the United States. Then, I sent Amir back to Kabul, now ruled by the Taliban, on one last desperate quest for redemption. Dr. Haled Hosseini was born in Kabul himself in 1965. He grew up in the last peaceful days of the Afghan monarchy, before revolution and before the Russian invasion, which would change his country forever. Like Amir and Hassan, he grew up watching American Westerns, playing soccer, flying kites, and fighting kites. In 1976, his family moved to Paris when his father was posted to the Afghan embassy there. After the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1980, his father sought political asylum in the United States, and the Hosseini family moved from France to San Jose, California. Dr. Hosseini is now a practicing physician and lives in San Jose with his wife and two children. 
The Kite Runner has already been optioned by DreamWorks and Wonderland Films. It is a San Francisco Chronicle Best Book of the Year, an Entertainment Weekly Top 10 Fiction Pick of the Year, an American Library Association Notable Book, a recipient of Borders Books 2003 Original Voices Award, and Book List's 2004 Alex Award. The Kite Runner is not only Dr. Hosseini's first novel, it is the first Afghan novel written in English. As Diane Struzzi wrote in the Hartford Current in 2003, this is more than just good writing. It is also a wonderfully conjured story that offers a glimpse into an Afghanistan most Americans have never seen and depicts a side of humanity rarely revealed. In The Kite Runner, Dr. Hosseini introduces us not only to his country, but also to our country to the cowardice of which we are all capable, to bravery which we can summon, and to love which is not diminished because it is undeserved. Dr. Hosseini, we thank you for creating Baba, whose nobility you've said is inspired by that of your own father. And for Hassan, who was a friend a thousand times over, and for Amir, who found a way to be good again. In your interview with NPR, you said that you hoped this story would resonate with people and that they would think about it long after it's done. I'm here to tell you that it did, and we thank you for it. Ladies and gentlemen, Khaled Hosani. Thank you, thank you. Um, I am so very honored that the Kite Runner was chosen for the One Book Program. And um, my deepest thanks to Betty Ann and Jim and Chris and everyone who, who, uh, who uh, put their faith in this book. And it's my sincere hope that myself and the novel will live up to the expectations of people in this region and uh, those who will participate in this project. Um, so my, my, my sincere my sincere thanks. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about how the book came about. And I want to do that because it's the question I kind of dread the most. And it's often the one that gets asked first. Maybe after, is this book autobiographical? But the one people ask always, um, almost right off the bat, is, is how did this story come to be? And it's a question I kind of dread because I'm, I, I, the whole the precise genesis of where stories come from, to me, is, is a bit of a mystery, as it is to many writers that I know. Um, the best that I can put it is that writing stories is a compulsion. And unless you write down what's in your head, you just might well implode. And I like what Stephen King said about writing stories. He said, if you have a story to tell and the ability to tell it, and you don't do it, then you're a monkey. And I think many writers write out of fear of monkeyhood, I guess. <laughs> so um, for me, at, at, the, at the risk of sounding highfalutin, um, stories take their origin in a, in a kind of a, a fog in the back of my head. Um, it starts at something amorphous and ill-defined and something vague that slowly takes shape as I wait for it to come forth and, and step toward me. And the kite runner began that way as well. And there were two things in the fog. One was very distinct. Um, one, it was a kite. And it was a, 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 a kite flying solo in a, in a blue winter sky over the cobble of my childhood covered in dazzling white snow. So it was a very concrete image and a very real image. And, it was, and I knew that that was the image that I was going to center my novel around. The second was a phrase a thousand times over. And, and I, I, with my mind's eye, um, I began with a kite, and I kind of followed it down to the ground, right down the string, and to see who was at the end of the string. And I found two sets of hands, boys' hands. One was clean, and the nails were polished, and the nails were well-trimmed. The other 
set of hands was grimy and calloused and it had chipped nails, maybe the hands of a boy who was accustomed to manual labor. And I thought about these boys tugging this string and as I, as I thought about them and thought about them, I realized that these boys were 12 years old, that they were both motherless, that both boys had been raised in the same households, that they were each other's first memories, that one of the boys' name was the other's first spoken word, and that the boys had for all practical purposes lived as brothers, except that they were very different. And for all of that, I sensed an undercurrent of melancholy, of sadness between the boys. And I felt that one of the boys had betrayed the other, and that something rather unspeakable had happened between the boys. And that's sort of how the story began. So I, I kind of want to put that aside and just briefly talk about something that happened in my own uh, personal life, which contributed to the writing of The Kite Runner. Um, as Chris said, I, w I was born in, the, in Kabul in, this, in the mid-1960s, and my father was a diplomat. He worked for the foreign ministry in Afghanistan. My mother was a high school teacher. She taught Farsi and history and went on to become a vice principal of a rather large girls' high school in Kabul. So I was brought up in an upper middle class family. I had a good life. I was uh, raised in a rather affluent neighborhood in northern Kabul, the same neighborhood, in fact, that in which Amir is raised, the, the protagonist of my book. In the early 70s, my father was assigned a diplomatic post in Iran. Uh, so my family moved to Tehran, and my father took with him, as was customary in those days, a cook. And this man was in his 30s, in his, probably in his early 30s, and he was uh, an ethnic Hazara. As you know, in Afghanistan, there are a whole variety of ethnicities. The largest one is called the Pashtun, and they're the ruling majority, and they've basically monopolized uh, the power uh, and, and the country really for over 200 years. The Hazaras, which Hossein Khan, this cook, belonged to, were re represented about 10% of the population, and they were one of the most put upon and most oppressed minorities in Afghanistan. They were descendants of the Mongol Empire, so they had very Asian features. So phenotypically, they looked different than other Afghans, and they were easily to pick out in a, easy to pick out in a crowd. Additionally, they were Shia Muslims, unlike most Afghans who belonged to the Sunni sect of Islam. Um, and Hossein Khan was in his 30s. At the time, I was maybe in, in third grade. And he and I struck a friendship. And uh, we became very, very fond of each other. And he became someone that I, I was very close to. And he took me out for walks and to the movies. And he became very, very protective of me. Um, but I remember that he never wrote. And he never got letters from his family in Afghanistan. And I, one day, I sort of casually asked him, how come? Um, and he told me that he was illiterate, that he had, he'd never been to school. He couldn't read. He couldn't write and that his father had never been to school, his grandfather had never been to school. In fact, no one in his, in his ancestry had ever been able to read and write. And I asked him, well, why is that? And um, I guess the best he could do is to smile at, at my naivete, I suppose. Um, and then I asked him, uh, well, do you want to learn? And he said, absolutely. So I, in essence, became uh, this guy's uh, tutor. So I sat down with him and went over the Farsi alphabet and uh, began assigning him homework, so to say, much like my own teacher in third grade was assigning me homework, except he was 33, 34, and I was a third, third grade boy. Um, and within a year, Hossein Khan could read children's books, and within two years, he could actually read um, Farsi newspapers slowly, but he could read it. And he, uh, it, I never really understood the depth to which this um, affected him and how it changed him as a person. And he was deeply, even um, tearfully grateful for this. And he uh, became very, very, very fond of me. We moved from Iran back to Afghanistan two years later, and Hossein Khan had to move away. He, um, his father was very ill in central Afghanistan, and his family had found a bride for him. So he moved back to the central mountainous region where many Hazaras live, called Hazarajat. 
And the day he left, he, was, uh, he could hardly look at me. And that was the first time I saw a grown man cry. And uh, so we said our farewells, and Hossein Khan moved on, and I never saw him again. And I don't know what's happened to him, and whether he's alive or not, and whether the various wars that have plagued my country have claimed him or not, I don't know. But he wrote a letter um, within a year after he moved, at the end of which he said something rather startling. He said, um, to, the letter was addressed to my father, and he said, please pass my best to Professor Khaled, which is how he had jokingly come to call me, and tell him that I would give my life for him a thousand times over. Which, I was stunned by this. Um, I never forgot those words, and they stayed with me for many, many, many years. And when I sat down to write this book, those words really rang in my head, and I was very interested in the idea of friendship, of what it means to be blindly loyal to someone, what it means to love someone without question, and very interestingly to me, what is the moral responsibility of someone who is on the receiving end of such guileless devotion, especially if they're in a position of power. So I began writing The Kite Runner uh, in March of 2001 with these ideas circling in my head. And the boys tugging on, those string, on that string took shape for me. One became Amir, a 12-year-old uh, uh, boy, the son of a, a very wealthy merchant in Kabul, an ethnic Pashtun, and therefore the ruling, dominating majority in Afghanistan. A very troubled boy, a conflicted boy, a boy who, um, whose moral compass didn't always point the right way. A boy who, 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 who genuinely wants to be a good human being, but who, to his own horror, is capable of betraying and of lying to and of taking advantage of those who love him the most. His alter ego, the other boy, became Hassan, an ethnic Hazara, like Hussein Khan from my own life, um, and a boy who, unlike Amir, was rooted in goodness, in integrity, and on very solid moral ground. And in the novel's pivotal scene, um, and in Amir's defining moment as a human being, um, the power dynamics of this relationship, master and servant, comes into play. And Amir watches Hassan be brutalized in a terrible way and does nothing. And it becomes the defining moment of his tragic life um, and a wrong that will haunt him um, forever. Um, the friendship is shattered and so are many lives around the boys in ways that Amir can't really understand until decades later. And in fact, it's decade la decades later that the story picks up. The boys are now on opposite sides of the world. Amir is in California, in exile, living a comfortable life, married. And Hassan is still in Afghanistan, in Kabul, now ruled by the Taliban. And Amir gets a phone call uh, from an old friend of his father's who asks him to come back to Afghanistan, ostensibly for a mission. But really, it becomes um, a, a much more than a trip back to the land of his childhood, a land that he can hardly recognize anymore. It really becomes a journey of atonement, a spiritual journey, and a trip during which Amir is really transformed um, as a human being. I began writing this book in March of 01. Um, and, and I really started it purely because I, as a, for, really for literary purposes, I, I had this story that I wanted to tell, these characters that had been in my head, and these themes that, that I just wanted to convey. But six months into the writing process, and about halfway through the manuscript, September 11th happened, um, and that changed everything. Suddenly, you know, Afghanistan was on the news. Suddenly, the cities of my childhood were you know, on CNN, uh, places nobody had ever heard of, and um, were being discussed by the likes of Dan Rather and Peter Jennings and whatnot. Um, and everyone was writing about Afghanistan. But everyone was writing nonfiction. Nobody was telling stories. And everyone was focusing on the Taliban. 
They were focusing on Al-Qaeda. They were focusing on bin Laden, on the war on terrorism. And here I was, halfway through this novel, this coming of age story that begins in the final days of the monarchy in the 70s and looks at the life of these two boys uh, over the decades. And I, and I for th at that moment, again at the, sound, at the risk of uh, sounding highfalutin, the novel took on a different purpose for me. And it, and it became for me at that point a passion because I felt like I had a story to tell that people would probably want to hear because I felt my book, if written with honesty and integrity, could serve as a vehicle to introduce a somewhat enigmatic country and society and people to the Western audience. And I felt that fiction is a wonderful way of talking about history, of talking about a country, and about a people. So it became more than just, I have this compulsion to tell this story that I really want to write down. It took on an additional dimension for me. And the book was done in June of 2002, published in June of 2003. And much to my, my endless pleasure, it, I, I, get, I get emails from my readers. And I find that they enjoy the book on two levels. A, they enjoy the book on a level of, of on a pure story level. Uh, they, they identify with the characters. Uh, many of the themes in my book, even though it's set in Afghanistan, are completely universal from a human standpoint. Um, it doesn't matter, as I was saying earlier, whether you're from Mystic or you're from Sudan or from Afghanistan or from France. You can identify with the themes of friendship, of guilt, of betraying someone you love, of the love between fathers and sons, and of redemption and losing your homeland. So those are universal things, and people have responded to the book in, on that level. But also, what they've told me is, is, and this is most gratifying for me, is that after reading the book, they feel like they understand the Afghan plight and the Afghan tragedy in a more personal way. That up to that, they knew what had happened in Afghanistan, but they didn't really know who the Afghan people were. They were mostly faces behind the reporter, uh, or there were uh, these guys in uh, caves in Tora Bora, or there were the women beggars and the orphans on the side of the street. But then the people tell me that they never really felt they understood who these people were. And after reading the book, the next time they see a news item about Afghanistan, the latest round of bombing or the latest attack, uh, that it hits them in a more personal way. So it's very gratifying for me to know that the book has helped, to whatever extent, it may be a small extent, um, humanize what has happened in Afghanistan for the audience um, at large. And when I look at the, at the list of events that are planned between now and September, uh, some of the talks that are going to be given, I'm so encouraged. I, I'm so, um, it's very, gr very, very gratifying for me. Um, I, I, I have received my personal rewards already for this book, not the least of which was writing the words, the end, and proving to myself that, I, yes, indeed, I could write a novel. Um, but on a, on a larger scale, I, 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 I was hoping that the book would, would keep a dialogue going on Afghanistan and to keep it alive in the, in the public consciousness. One of the, the fears of the Afghan people is Afghanistan will be forgotten as it was after the Soviet war. And I want people to remember that there's still, despite the war in Iraq, there's still an Afghanistan, that there's still a country in Central Asia, you know, whose map looks like this, like a, like a fist with a protruding thumb, where people salt their pomegranates and eat grapes with bread. And, and, I, and I want people to remember that. And, and, and if this book, in even a small way, helps contribute to that dialogue, then I, then I feel um, that, that, that the book will have done uh, a service and I will be very gratified. So that's what I have to say about how the novel came to be, what I think of it, and what I hope it will do. I was just going to read very briefly, uh, maybe a couple of minutes, about the, f I read the first chapter, which is very short, it's like a page and a half, and it's kind of the hook into, uh, into the story. It picks up Amir, as an adult in California when he receives this phone call that sends him back to Afghanistan to try to uh, right this wrong that has haunted him all these years. 
So this picks up in December of 2001. I became what I am today at the age of 12 on a frigid, overcast day in the winter of 1975. I remember the precise moment, crouching behind a crumbling mud wall and peeking into the alley near the frozen creek. That was a long time ago, but it's wrong what to say about the past I've learned, about how you can bury it, because the past claws its way out. And looking back now, I realize I've been peeking into that deserted alley for the last 26 years. One day last summer, my friend Rahim Khan called from Pakistan and he asked me to come and see him. Standing in the kitchen with the receiver to my ear, I knew it wasn't just Rahim Khan on the line, it was my past of unatoned sins. After I hung up, I went for a walk along Spreckles Lake on the northern edge of Golden Gate Park. The early afternoon spun, sun sparkled on the water where dozens of miniature boats sailed, propelled by a crisp breeze. And then I glanced up and saw a pair of kites, red with long blue tails, soaring in the sky. They danced high above the trees on the west end of the park, over the windmills, floating side by side like a pair of eyes looking down on San Francisco, the city I now call home. And suddenly, Hassan's voice whispered in my head, for you, a thousand times over, Hassan, my hair-lipped kite runner. I sat on a park bench near a willow tree, and I thought about something Rahim Khan said just before he hung up, almost as an afterthought. There is a way to be good again. And I looked up at those twin kites, and I thought about Hassan, I thought about my father. I thought about Ali and Kabul. And I thought of the life I had lived until the winter of 1975 came along and changed everything and made me what I am today. So that's sort of the, the intro. And then much of the book is a uh, protracted flashback going back to what, ha uh, you know, what happens with the boys and what leads everything up to this uh, pivotal scene and then on back to Kabul and so on. So I'll stop there. Um, I, I've, I've talked much longer than I, I think I ever have. <laughs> I'm always a little um, weary of how long I, I speak. So I, if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. Um, if there aren't, I'll give it back to Betty Ann. Yes? Have I gone back to Kabul? Um, I went back to Kabul. I left it when I was 11 in 1976. And I went back last March um, uh, as a 38-year-old physician, father, soon-to-be-published writer, husband. Um, and I, I guess your next question is, how did I find it? How did I know that? Uh, <laughs> I, I, um, it, 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 I was heartbroken. Uh, it's very, very difficult to go back to a place that has changed that much. Um, I remember I was for two... I was fortunate enough to live in Afghanistan in its heyday, and my departure from Afghanistan was very fortuitous. I left before the Soviet takeover. So when I went back, I went back to find a place that had witnessed 25 years of warfare. And it's one thing to read about it in the paper and see the news. It's a whole different thing to walk amid the ruins of war. It's a very, very moving experience. Uh, you can immediately from the airplane, when you look down as you're landing on, in Kabul, you can tell because the runway is littered with carcasses of airplanes, with overturned trucks, with burnt wings, and so on. And the minute you get out of the airport, you're mobbed by beggars. And I remember there was this, this, this group of kids that ran up to us as we were l putting our luggage into the trunk. And I went with my brother-in-law and I, we were giving out money, like you're not supposed to do. Uh, and, um, and one of the kids didn't get a bill, and he like let out this cry that, <laughs> that like haunted me for the rest of that day. And I turned to my brother-in-law, I said, man, I, I don't think I can last here for two weeks. But, you know, you move on, and uh, you know, you, you kind of, the scenery 
you kind of get used to the scenery, and then you, you, you walk through the neighborhoods and you see what all these years of warfare have done to these people. I saw beggars and I saw orphans and widows and people who just suffered through all these wars. But what I remember the most about this trip is that despite everything that had happened to these people, how courageous these people were and how they had made, managed to maintain their hopes, their dreams, and their integrity alive, despite really the most horrifying conditions you can imagine. More than once, I was invited to dinner by a beggar. Uh, I would talk to somebody on the street, and then they, would, they were so generous in sharing their life stories with me and telling me what had happened with them. And then they would say, why don't you come to our place? and have tea and often they live on the side of a street or uh, you know some roofless uh, four walls or something like that. So I came back with a tremendous sense of admiration for these really resilient and brave people. Yes ma'am. Yeah, the, do I have to repeat the questions or can anybody, everybody hear? Can everybody hear? Okay. Um, I, I, uh, I worked full time as I was writing this novel. So um, I, I write very early in the morning. So I, for this novel, I would get up around five and write till about eight. Then I get ready to go to work, see my patients, do the same thing the next day. Uh, so uh, that, that happens to coincide with my quote, creative time. And it's a very quiet, soulful time of the day that I, that I really enjoy. And so it, wasn't, it really wasn't that bad to manage the two. And I, and I, and I have no plans to give up my, my medical practice. I'm in a very, very comfortable stage of my medical career. I've gotten to know my patients, in fact, their families and children and so on. And so I've been able to balance out the writing and the medicine, and I, and I will probably continue doing both. Good. Thank you. Thanks for your, your time.